Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview. Lions Hall, Canisius College, Buffalo, New York. It is the 8th of May, 2008, approximately 9 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? William Callahan Lyons. On the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in 1946 at Sisters Hospital on Main Street in Buffalo, New York. Okay. Um, it was, what was Sunday, you? by the way, right after a Canisius basketball game, in which they won. <laughs> but my mother didn't go, just my dad. What was your educational background prior to entering service? I was uh, a graduate, let's see, one of, I was the last, one of the last graduates with an eighth grade diploma from Felton Grammar Junior High School at the time in North Tonawanda. We were still doing eighth grade graduations. In 1965 from Bishop Gibbons High School in North Tonawanda. And then in 1969 I graduated from college here. Okay. Now you were in the ROTC program? The ROTC was mandatory at Canisius College uh, then. There were a lot of rumors as to why, how much the Jesuits got paid for putting the Army on campus, but nobody ever knew the truth, which is really typical. Um, it was a time when um, the war was starting to percolate over in, the, in Southeast Asia. It had been going on for a little while. Under the, actually, Eisenhower administration, a small amount, a trickle. Um, and then a, another man with military experience, uh, Jack Kennedy, sent a few more troops in. Uh, but a man without any military experience um, and another Texas politician who uh, sent in a whole bunch of guys. I'm not sure, I'm never sure why, uh, but uh, we got up to 500,000 troops under Lane Johnson. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when I was enrolled as a freshman, it was pretty standard. We just did our OTC. No, nobody, there wasn't any place to do it. Um, we used to. Uh, March in the Quadrangle, because uh, the old Sisters Hospital building was still standing on what is now the Kessler. It was torn down when we were here, and then we used to use that to practice marching and then the armory. But everybody did it. Um, and the pro it was an interesting time because I think the power of the professor rose to inordinate levels. Because if you flunked out of school, you were drafted. Like it was immediate. In fact, I was in Washington three weeks ago. Um, stopped to see my mother and dad's grave. We just buried him. I stopped talking. Wants to stop the thing? Um, so I'd stopped to see. Uh, there was a, an error made by father's headstone. Date of birth was wrong. Up in Arlington to check it. And, uh, Tommy Flanagan, who was commander of the Corps of Cadets. Johnny Burns, who I sang with in the Glee Club. And Dick plunked out and got killed. John plunked out of graduate school. He was a class of 67. And, uh, Tom was a chopper pilot. Or a board observer pilot. Got shot down. Okay. Okay. I normally don't react quite that way, but. Uh, but the Professors knew they had that power to flunk us out. And they became very politically active, um, very anti-war. And those of us who were in ROTC, particularly in the Advanced Corps, had to be very careful to make sure we didn't take the wrong classes or they'd flunk us out. Um, and it was happening. Uh, there were a couple of these guys who were real assholes. Fortunately, Father Dembski was a military guy, and had some understanding of that. Um, but uh, again, the days of academic freedom and all the rest of it. But the big issues on campus then were, were um, in '67, uh, were the race riots in the city. 
I was elected student government president, I think it was April 5th of 68. Right before the Martin Luther King was assassinated the next day. And I remember meeting with uh, Father Maloney and Mike Langan and Father Gumsky, trying to decide whether or not to close the school. And our concern was to close it for safety purposes because of the riots. And uh, Father Dembski was adamant that we were not going to back down. I was excused from that meeting with Mike and uh, Father Maloney. And about an hour later, uh, Mike came out and told me to go over to ROTC and tell them to lower the flags to have staff. They were very difficult times. Um, and then I, I entered the service. I went on active duty right after graduation. My first set of orders right to the house told me I was going to now. And uh, I walked out. I went to the ROTC department. I, I had just been out of school like a week. And I went over. I said, "Is this real?" And the guy says, "Oh yeah, it's real." And I was on a set of orders with one of my classmates, and uh, he got the same set. So off we went, um, what, June 28th, 29th, 1969, to Fort Lee, Virginia, and uh, the U.S. Army Quartermaster School. And we had nine weeks of the supply officers class, and then nine weeks of the basic officers, supply officers class, or wherever the hell it was, I don't remember. In between, I got a week's leave and came home and got married to a young woman who was my undergraduate classmate and college student. And if you signed up to go volunteer indefinite, now I had a regular army commission as an infantry officer, which I didn't accept. I just took my reserve commission uh, because I didn't particularly want to. My dad, who's been a World War II Marine, suggested I get sure I get somewhere I wouldn't have to walk, <laughs> as he put it. So I. Uh, didn't accept the, because uh, I was a distinguished military graduate. There were 400 guys that applied for the advanced course, advanced program in ROTC in 67. They accepted 70 of us. Um, out of the 70 of us, I think there were 10 of us that were DMGs, distinguished military graduates. Um, it was pretty neat. I mean, they gave you some options, um, none of which were lesser of evils, not a lot of great choices. Nobody was offering you two weeks in Paris, post-paid. But, uh, so I went on active duty, the, like I said, at the end of June. And they offered us a program where if you went voluntary indefinite, which effectively meant you were going to stay in the Army, and I didn't particularly know what I wanted to do after I got out of the service anyway. So I said, why not? So that extended your tour, and, and, and frankly, the longer you stayed in the States, the war was winding down. Nixon was president. They figured maybe it wouldn't, you wouldn't make it uh, overseas to the combat zone. So I went indefinite and uh, went on from Fort Lee to Fort Bliss, Texas, where I was a property book officer, supply officer for the U.S. Army Air Defense School. From, what was it, December of 69 until June of 71. My oldest daughter, uh, Dr. Lyons, Ignatius College, 1991, is a history professor at the University of Central Florida. She was born um, at William Beaumont General Army Hospital. And um, eight weeks later, I went overseas. Maybe ten weeks, I don't remember. I was a captain. Whereabouts did you land? Um, well, uh, landed in a couple places. To get to Vietnam, you got to land in more than one place. Mm -hmm. uh, St. Louis, uh, Oakland, the big island of Hawaii. I landed on Okinawa. Sent my dad a postcard from Okinawa. He'd been shot up there. He still had the postcard when he Thanked him for making sure all the gooks were dead. 
And then we landed, we, went, we came into uh, Long Bend. Uh, what were your impressions as soon as you got off the plane there? Smell. First thing that hits you is the smell. Combination of diesel fuel and nuke mine. It's, a, it's something you never forget. Um, weird stuff. And the rice, I'm out of I hate rice. My father hated rice. I can't stand rice. The bastard shows me rice to throw right in the fucking face. I have a couple friends who were in Vietnam that will not touch any kind of oriental foods. Yeah, no chance. I mean, the, I mean, they used to eat it with maggots. God knows what else they'd mix in with it. They get protein. But I'm an American. I want beef. So, so I served as the last commanding officer of the U.S. Army Depot at Cameron. Closed it uh, from July, middle of July, uh, 71, until we, I signed off on the final morning report December 1st, 1971. We moved millions of dollars worth of equipment back to the Philippines, to Guam, to Japan, to Korea. Um, we had the 101st Airborne pull on our perimeter defense and they pulled them. So we were working days, moving equipment and nights, protecting our lines. Were you uh, hit with rockets and mortars? We were regularly period? rocketed, regularly mortared. Um, I only drew my sidearm once and fired in anger. I, I directed fire, but I, uh, <laughs> we had some little shit sitting out in Iraq one time, taking pot shots at us with an AK-47 and small arms fire on him. He stopped for a while and started shooting again. So we called in a 155 battery and threw some junk on him. And he stopped for a while and started again. So we called in the Air Force, blew the rock away. <laughs> End of that problem. Yeah, we yeah yeah they were. In fact, a month to the day after I left Cameron, I was on the last Freedom Bird that flew out of Cameron on January twenty eighth, seventy two. Um, the NBA overran Cameron. It's now a Russian submarine base. Mm -hmm. We floated in two DeLong piers, and uh, so they're using both the DeLong piers and the old French pier for the Russian submarine. As far as I know, I mean, I haven't been back. I got a good friend in Buffalo who owns coffee plantations in Vietnam. Maybe I'll go back with him one of these days. I was just going to ask, do you think you'd ever want to go back? Warren Emblich Warren's, owns McCullough Coffee and Warren's a buddy of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just kidding with him the other day because he just got back. I said, next time maybe I'll go and be his valet. Yeah, why not? Why not? Um, I'd like to see what Cameron Bay, where I was, was gorgeous. I mean, We'd go swimming in the, in the South China Sea, and you could read the label on a bottle of Budweiser in 15 feet of water. It was just, I mean, it was like swimming in an aquarium. It was incredible. Um, that part of the world, I mean, if you ever build a golf course there, it would rival some of the most beautiful places in the world. Now, were you with uh, the 1st Logistical Command? I was with the U.S. Army Depot Cameron Bay, <laughs> which was... That's what it was. It was the largest logistics facility to date that the United States military ever had in a foreign country. It was huge. Um, trucks, tanks, jeeps, and building after building after building after building. Um, was there much left behind? No. No. We, we, anything worthwhile, we moved out. Uh, when I got done, I signed the final morning report and signed the final disposition of property. I think we charged off $2,400 in sheets and pillowcases that we couldn't find. Everything else was good. Busted my butt. But I'm a Republican. We don't waste. We're not like the Democrats. Throw it away, give it away. Yeah. No, we worked hard. I worked the kids hard. I had 1,500 men in that battalion at one time. We got down to one company. And um, a lot of kids. <laughs> I was 24, I was old. 16, 17, 18 year old kids. Some of them 16, they lied again. 
coming out of nowhere. Yeah. Did you have many Vietnamese working for you? Some. Most of them were drug smugglers, though. Um, we had a lot of problems with heroin coming down out of China. It was in very sophisticated plastic vials. The women would hide it in the private parts. We'd have to have people go through and check them and smuggle it onto the base. Did you have much drug use on the base at that time? Well, more than we'd like. Um, it was a cultural issue, partly. Um, again, Senator George McGovern came over and said we were being nasty to these poor kids. Asshole. Um, I should have shot him then. What about uh, race relations there? Any problems? Well, one of my lieutenants, <clears throat> Well, a kid who was a ROTC cadet here behind me, Bobby Herzog, was with the 101st before they left, and most of those kids, were, the rear echelon kids were black kids. And I, I asked him where his sidearm was, and he wasn't carrying it. He found them doing something and tried to stop it. They beat him up, but he had no witnesses. The next day he was carrying his 45. I would have used it. They were tough. But the Army was, according to Harry Truman, not segregated anymore, but it was. Part of it was uh, Lyndon Johnson, like the great society stuff, created this thing called Project 100,000, where we took on kids out of the poverty belt, black kids. Most of them couldn't read. And we had to paint the decks, the docks, certain colors and tell them to put the yellow boxes on the yellow colors because they couldn't read. And that only, you know, and then some guys see those guys not working and the other guys are working and it only exacerbates it. And uh, a lot of it was because the kids who couldn't read weren't hustling with the black kids. But that, that wasn't a function of being black. It was a function mm -hmm. of the poverty that they came from. But Johnson decided that he was going to fix the problem by putting 100,000 in the service. They never should have been there. At least not without going to school first. Do you think what you learned at Canisius and, and the three schools you went to, Lee, at Lee and Bliss, so on, prepared you for some of the things you faced there? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't... I don't think I was ill-prepared at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it didn't hurt that uh, my father was a commissioned officer. I'd been raised to, to be one. You know? I mean, mm -hmm. there wasn't any question about it. Um, and I knew how to give orders and knew how to take them. Um, that's what you do. The politics of the war were difficult. I mean, I came home a couple of times, got spit on out of bus windows and stuff, in uniform. Um, How did you feel about the anti-war demonstrations back home? I was a lieutenant on active duty at Fort Lee, Virginia, in September of 1969, when they had the protest in Washington. There were classmates of mine at that protest, and I was wearing a sidearm and was prepared to go up and shoot them if I had to. Not because I hated them or anything mm -hmm. like that. That was my job. Mm -hmm. um, Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I was in Florida. My daughter, the history professor, lives in Florida. My another daughter lives in California, and the youngest one is in Manhattan. And uh, so I have a granddaughter in Southern California and a grandson in Florida, so I, I leave Buffalo in the wintertime and go chase my grandkids around. But um, I played golf by accident. I showed up at a golf course and got sent out with three other guys, two of whom were retired Lutheran ministers. And the guys, the guy who was in the cart with said they were equivalent to being bishops in the Lutheran church. I said, well, that's interesting. I said, well, I was raised in the Jesuit Irish Roman Catholic tradition. And uh, he started to try to explain to me the differences. I said, I really don't care. I don't practice it. Um, I'm a deist. There's a God out there, but I really don't think he gets involved too much with us. And he started to try to tell me something about how I ought to believe. And I said, have you ever carried a 45? I said, have you ever 
taken it out of the holster and fired another human being, tried to kill him. You know, I said, you haven't got a right to tell me how to think about anything. I carried that 45 so you could practice your religion the way you want to, and I can believe the way I want to. And don't try to tell me yours, because you haven't got the right to do that. After that, we had a nice chat on the golf course, but no more religion. Mm -hmm. I have wars are fought over religions. So when did you return to the States? January, let's see, the plane landed on a Saturday morning. It was the 29th. We're coming out of Chicago when the pilot said, welcome to Buffalo, there's no temperature. <laughs> and that was before there were tarmacs, or the, the gateways. So they got off the plane and walked across the tarmac, and I was in my lightweight greens. I'd never been so cold in my life. Frozen. Got it. But my daughter was there. feel about getting back? My dad and I sat and talked for a long time. He said, There's something about being a commissioned officer in a town dance hall and having that same experience with your father. changes the relationship. Yeah, I woke up this morning about 4 o'clock and I got diabetes from Agent Orange exposure. Where did that happen? In, uh, In Cameron? Or? Yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly. I have a set of orders that appointed me a chemical disposal officer and I got rid of stuff. We didn't know what the hell it was. <laughs> Throw some diesel oil on it, burn it. I uh, I was a bachelor of science and marketing, not a chemistry guy. I didn't know what I was dealing with. When did you find out uh, you were diabetic, afflicted with it? Um, actually, the, I was working for a bank down the southern tier. I was executive vice president of the bank and president of the holding company, and they wanted to put an insurance policy on me, a pretty big one, because we didn't have a lot of management debt. And so they sent in some nurse to take my blood for the insurance physical, and she came back and said, there's a problem with the blood. We don't know what it is, but it must have been a mistake. So they came back and took a second blood test and said, you got diabetes. Um, and it was at the same time that the VA recognized that there's a correlation between service in Vietnam and diabetes. They don't know exactly what the connection is, but the incidence of diabetes among men of my age who were in them is like off the charts. So they've recognized it as a causal relationship. And the VA's been one. I called the hospital this morning because my blood sugar was below 70. And the nurse got back to me like at 7.30 this morning. Um, and uh, talked to the doctor. But I know normally once I eat something, I'm pretty much okay. You have to take insulin shots? No, I'm not doing the shots. I'm just medication. It's adult onset type 2. Mm -hmm. My sister's an adult nurse practitioner, a Ubel graduate, and... Uh, has a specialty in diabetes, and there's something unusual about the one that we've got. It's a strain, you know. She tells me they don't know too much, but we got it. Could be worse. Mm -hmm. Charlie could have killed me, but I could see him coming. So I'm glad we had it. The folians work wonderfully in terms of clearing fields of fire. If that's the worst thing I got to deal with. That's nothing. They're good to me. The folks up there are wonderful. Yeah, I can't say enough about the VA healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Anywhere I go in the country. Uh, and uh, I can take care of myself, exercise, and eat the way I ought to. Probably won't affect my life expectancy at all. Now, did you decide to stay in the service, or after the experience? In fact, my graduating class in 1969, and the and the graduating class of the military academy at West Point had the highest resignation rate of officers. In the country. That's according to a piece in the New York Times two years ago. It was a mess. 
that was very, like I told you, one of my lieutenants from here got beat up. There was no discipline left. Um, there was no capacity to support company grade officers. Uh, it wasn't worth the risk. And then the war was ending. And when wars end, promotions slow down. Um, they start eliminating people, cut back. So it wasn't a good place to be. I mean, if, if you're going to be in the service, the time to be in the service is during a war. That's when you make your points. Mm -hmm. Now I had made my points. I could have, I mean, I, you know, but they offered me ROTC duty back in the States after my tour now, which would have concluded in July. Um, but the war was ugly uh, by then. We were pulling out. And um, so I said, no, I think I'll just give up my opportunity for ROTC and go become a civilian again. I mean, I got a, I got a call from Guam, the Pentagon. My phone still worked over there. What do you want to do? I told him. I said, okay. So as soon as I was done closing out the depot, I was assigned to the uh, 124th Transportation Battalion as a holding position just to sit on the morning report until I was released from active duty, which was the end of January. It took about six weeks. Flew home, got off the plane, um, and was home. That was a little goofy. <laughs> Going from 95 degrees and rockets and mortars and helicopters to snow, freezing cold. Did you have any trouble getting back into the civilian life? Oh, well, yeah. I don't think anybody doesn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, don't, I guess I would say define what do you mean by trouble and mm -hmm. civilian life. Um, first of all, I, did, I had a, a wife and a baby and no job, because um, that wasn't the plan. Uh, it was cold. I didn't particularly want to go outside, and, and, and I wasn't about to take up skiing at that point. Um, I remember one, we, were, we, we, we started picking up kind of where we left off, and uh, Saturday nights we were at the odd watching Canisius play basketball. and. Uh, the baby was still pretty small, so we'd take the baby out to grandma's and grandpa's, her mom's and dad's, and then um, we'd stay overnight over there sometimes, so I'd come on home. And the fire sirens went off in Chictawaga, and I was under the bed. Woke up on the hardwood floor. And, what are you doing down there? And, uh, I was ready for the incoming. Well, it was a little startling, you know. but uh, when you're 25 years old, which I was, and you got a family, and you're trying to figure out what you're going to do next, um, you don't have a lot of time to think about readjusting. You got to mm -hmm. feed your family. So I ended up going to work. I, I, I interviewed for the last day that they were hiring for the training program in Marine Midland Bank. And my couple, first couple of interviews didn't go real well. Um, whether that was anti-war sentiment or not, I, I don't know, but some, in one case I'm, I suspect it was. But I got up to one of the senior guys and uh, he said, what are you doing here? He says, your resume says you're looking for a job as a salesman. I said, well, you need them. I said a year ago, I was a captain in the United States Army, owned a home in Texas, came home to Buffalo before I went overseas, wanted to buy a washer and a dryer because we were doing old-fashioned things like washing diapers back then, you know, and um, went into a Marine Midland branch and applied for a credit card to buy the washer and dryer because I didn't know how long it was going to take to get my paycheck back home. It wasn't a question of the inability to pay, it was just a question of conserving cash. And they turned me down. And he turned around in his big old chair, and all I saw was the back of this leather chair for about five minutes. And the next thing I heard was, you're fired. And he hung up the phone and said, you're hired. He, whoever the guy was that turned me down, he fired him on the spot. Of course, he had started MasterCard. <laughs> so I, that's, how I got, that's how I started my career in banking. And um, there were two of us in my management training class at Marine that were now vets. And people were afraid of us. It was amazing. 
Bob and I, Bob ended up retiring out of the SBA, and, and uh, uh, he, had, he had graduated from Villanova, and they came back and got his master's here at UB. So he had his MBA, started on the GI Bill, and we started the training program together. So he'd been back a little bit longer than I had. But sometimes we'd wander off on a Friday to have our lunch, and uh, sometimes it would be a liquid lunch. And nobody ever said a word to us because they were afraid we'd kill them on the spot. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> Bob and I were not killer types, but they knew we'd been to now. Did you ever use the GI Bill? Yeah, I did. I, I started my MBA program here at Canisius with it. Uh, Chip Keene, one of my classmates, was teaching me pre-MBA calculus. I went for four weeks. And we had a quiz. I walked in with the quiz and... I opened up the book to look up the formulas. He said, you can't look up the formulas. You've got to memorize them. I said, what, are you crazy? I walked out and never went back. I said, that's what a book's for. So, yeah, four weeks. Yeah. Almost all the other education I had for the companies that I worked for paid for. I had a lot of continuing ed, but never did that. Did you ever join veterans organizations? I'm a member of uh, the American Legion Post at the Saturn Club, which meets twice a year, Memorial Day and Veterans Day, for a lovely luncheon. Uh, my father-in-law took me to join the VFW Post in Depew, and they said I wasn't eligible because I wasn't a veteran of a war. Vietnam wasn't a war. He was so crushed because he was looking forward to us being comrades together over there, and they wouldn't have me. This was... Vietnam, while I was in a war, that's a police action. Um, I'm a member of the, a, um, what is it? Just, I don't know, the one in Washington, Vietnam Veterans, whatever it is. And uh, I was treasurer and then president of the um, VBLP, the Vietnam Veterans Leadership Program here in Buffalo that built the monument down on the waterfront. Uh, worked with Senator McCain to help help us when he was congressman, Jack Kemp used to bring him home here to help us raise money for it. Um, I'm on his campaign committee, Senator McCain's, mm -hmm. like those conservative Republicans. You know. Love him, yeah. it'll make sense. And um, I don't know how I ever ended up here at Canisius, but there are a few of us, uh, uh, Billy Scretton, a few of us Republicans around here. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was over in Vietnam with you or in the service with you? Uh, Ron Pelosi, who's the mayor of the city of Tonawanda, he's my classmate from high school, college, and he was in Nam. I maintained some contact with Ronnie, not a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Charlie Leone was a classmate of mine that was on the same set of orders. From, um, I did for a number of years, and then he got married and started having his own kids much later in life, and um, I, I run into him once in a while. Mike Rehack, who's a classmate of mine here, didn't go to Nam, but he was stationed in uh, Alaska. And by the time, if I had taken an overseas tour rather than going to El Paso, uh, I wouldn't have gone to Nam either, because the war was winding down and the Army wasn't paying to move you from an overseas tour, so Mike never made it. A um, bunch of guys that were classmates of mine who took over, like Jimmy McGugan went to Panama. Um, Terry McLaughlin went to Germany. They never, they never rotated over to Nam because the war was winding down. Mm -hmm. you know, we were there cleaning it up. How do you think your time in the service had an effect on your life? Hmm. I don't know. I, 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 I mean, it's, I'm a different person because of it. My classmates will tell you that. Um, my ex-wife will tell you that. Um, I, 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 my perspective on history is different because of it. Um, what I see is that uh, the, since um, when I look, look at the presidents of the United States, the ones who have been to war don't send us to war. We had cowards like Clinton and 
guys like Bush, who, because of his father, avoided military, real military commitment. Um, they don't understand. But it's the old man understood. Eisenhower understood. Jack Kennedy understood. You, you don't do that. And if you do it, you do it right. No pussy going around. You can't fight a war half-assed. You can't do Rumsfeld. You can't do, what was it, McNamara's doctor? Do it on the cheap. You're going to go in and you got to kill people. you got to kill them. It's real simple. But I would have felt that way had I gone in arm or not. Um, I suppose my father being a Marine <laughs> might have something to do with that. My Uncle Joe, Joe was, uh, and Uncle George were both uh, naval officers. And we were not allowed to talk sentimentally about Irish history in our family because the goddamn Irish harbored those motherfucking Germans during World War II in their harbor. And so we wouldn't dare support Irish activities because those Irish helped kill American boys. And I still feel that way. Mm -hmm. I'm an American. Okay. Well, thank you for your interview. You're welcome.